I was practicing as a doctor, um, but I'd always been interested in script writing and films, a big uh, fan of film going. And I was always curious about the way film stories are put together. And so script writing was something I always wanted to do. And then about 1990 or so, I had the idea for a film a script, which subsequently became Shallow Grave. I just started writing, thinking, well, if it doesn't come to anything, I've had a go, and maybe it'll just sit in a drawer. But then, of course, and, you know, one thing led to another, I ended up making the film. In terms of Shallow Grave and train spotting, having done medicine was quite useful because there was quite a lot of uh, medically, medically related problems in those films, you know, dismemberment in Shallow Grave and then all the drug taking and so on in train spotting, uh, and I had sort of personal experience of dealing with uh, heroin addicts and so on. So, yeah, it was, it was quite helpful. Andrew McDonald gave me a copy of Train Spotting, and I read it. I thought it was just a fantastic book. I'd never come across anything like it. When I first read Train Spotting. I was actually more struck by the qualities that would make it a very bad film, um, because there was no story, nor no single story. Rather, there were lots of different stories, lots of different voices. We were trying to get down to the essence of the adventurousness of the novel and the kind of reckless, extreme lifestyle that the characters were leading that perhaps made it so captivating. <laughs> Renton is the probably the most frequent voice you hear. Choose life, choose a job, choose a career. And he's the most articulate. And I, th I think uh, he was the sort of natural choice as hero. What's your name? Diane. Where are you going, Diane? One of the the good things about being fairly inexperienced in remote train spotting was I didn't feel any burden of uh, expectation or anything, and I wasn't too bothered about technique or thinking too much about what makes a good screenplay. So in the end, I think the screenplay was quite sort of chaotic, and I think some of the, some of the film was slightly chaotic as well. <laughs> but I actually think that eventually that was part of its, um, its success. I, I find that when I'm writing, each, each film is different, and uh, sometimes you start off with the idea for the story, sometimes just for a character and his situation, and then you kind of can work out what happens from there. Adaptations are easier than original screenplays, principally because someone has done a lot of the hard work, or most of the hard work. Someone's thought up the story, invented the character, and so on. The difficulty is, I think, comes when you try and be too faithful to the text. So you've just got to be ruthless and say, you know, what is this? I'm making the film for the person who sees it in the cinema, not for, you know, the, the dead author or the living author or anyone like that. In adapting the book, you have to identify what is the most, what is most important about it, what is the most important part of the story, what characters are you going to keep? Because you usually can't keep all the characters, so you have to amalgamate some of them. And then are there any particular outstanding scenes which you just feel demand to be put in the film? One of the scenes that attracted a lot of attention in Trainspotting was that scene where uh, Ewan McGregor disappears down the toilet. Um, that scene was inspired by, or ripped off from, however you like to look at it, a scene in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street where uh, an actress whose name escapes me is uh, falls asleep in the bath and then is sucked under the bath. And I was always terribly moved by that scene. So I was writing this scene in uh, Trainspotter and he goes into the bedding shop toilet and he loses his suppositories and stuff like that. And it's really disgusting, you know? And how do you get out of that scene? You know, you can't just, it, it's, it's so kind of extreme. I just thought you can't just kind of stand up and walk away. I thought, well, what happens next? Well, maybe it just goes down your toilet. And uh, that was it. In the book, um, I think uh, called Matty or Matthew, and I think he and we sort of merged him with the character of Tommy, and the. Uh, but I think and there was a, a chapter, a particular cap chapter I remember called Memories of Matty, which I was always very sort of moved by. It was just Matt, Matthew's funeral, and uh, each of the congregation at the funeral was reminiscing in their in their own head. But it's, a, you know, it's like a short film or even a kind of 30-minute film in itself. Um, so it just could never make it into the... And Matty wasn't a main character in the rest of our story, so it just never made it. The um, sort of first assembly of Trainspotting, you know, before it had gone through the editing process, I, I was a bit um, worried because I thought it was a bit of a mess and didn't make much sense and so on. And I could see as the weeks went by and watching it once a week with the editing guy, I, I could really feel that the film was improving a lot. I felt that it was sort of faithful to the spirit of the novel, and it had some of the same qualities, sort of excitement and humour and all that, so I was really pleased. And when I look back on the film now, 
Uh, I'm still very pleased with it, partly because I'm in it. I'm in the opening 30 seconds or something as one of the security guards, which is a uh, little known feature. There's a little slice of mayhem. I think it's great. I really like it. Trainspotting was very successful. And um, in the wake of that, there was some speculation that we had, Danny and Andrew and I, had inaugurated a new year of British film. But I think that was inevitably misguided. Uh, British film seems to wax and wane, goes from you know, triumph to disaster the whole time. But it's not like uh, the kind of juggernaut of Hollywood filmmaking where, you know, they're all part of the same uh, movement. Involvement in Trainspotting probably opened doors and made life and careers easier for everyone who's involved in it. Of the three films I've made since Trainspotting, um, A Lifeless Ordinary, not quite so confrontational as Trainspotting. Uh, the Beach was obviously you know, a studio-financed attempt at mainstream filmmaking in its own way. Um, I did, however, make one other film um, called The Final Curtain, which was uh, perhaps more in the fashion of Shallow Grave or Trainspotting, and it has reached a very narrow audience, precisely zero at the moment, because it hasn't been released. Casting Trainspotting was pretty easy, because once we'd made the decision that we wanted you in as Renton, we were all agreed on Robert Carlyle as, as Begbie. Ewan Bremner was an actor, we'd seen him in the stage play of Trainspotting and Spud seemed great for him. And then we met John, you know, we met John Lee Miller um, and again, you know, he, seemed, he, seemed, he seemed right. Danny and Andrew and I worked uh, in a way that uh, I think was successful because we didn't try and do each other's jobs. There was no way I was going to turn up in the set and try and direct and Neither Danny and I sort of got involved in the either the nuts and bolts of production or either in the sort of diplomatic side of production. We tended to leave all that to Andrew. And they didn't phone me up and say, I don't like this line. I think you've got I've got an idea for a better one and stuff like that. You know, we just had our arguments but basically respected each other's positions. Entertainment can be in the form of sadness, you know, feeling sorry for a character. Also some moments of tension and laughter. You know, I, think, I don't think there's any great mystery, anything that makes people laugh or just feel some sort of emotion. Principally, they want to be entertained. <laughs> <laughs>